Recently, I decided it was time to grow a pair and finally get to work on making a custom STM32 dev board. Since I had been working with Arduino and ESP32 for the past two years, and this is the next logical step towards making a proper single board computer to the likes of a Raspberry Pi. But even though I'd never even touched an STM32 yet, I decided to make things even more hard for myself and hop on the YouTube trend of making the smallest breakout for it I could. Equally as important to me was that the processor could beat an ESP32 S3 and it had enough GPIOs broken out to control the 250 gram robots I'll be attempting to make in the upcoming videos. First, let's talk about the microcontroller I chose. The STM32H523HEY6TR, which crams a 250 megahertz processor into this wafer level package that is four to five times smaller compared to your average QFN or QFP. It does this by putting the electrical connections to the PCB straight underneath the silicon die instead of having long copper wires going out to a lead frame. Our chip has 22 usable GPIOs within its 39 pin package, so it's safe to say we'll have enough for those tiny robots. But now the question is, how are we gonna break them out in the smallest way possible? Because needless to say, standard pitch headers are way too big for that. Well, the ultimate goal here is to mount the microcontroller PCB onto a carrier board, which will house the circuitry to make those robots drive motors, read time of flight sensors, manage a battery, and more. So for a low profile application, we can either go the route of an LGA, which puts the breakout pads underneath the module like the ones used in Arduino Nanos and ESP32 Minis, or we can go the castellated route, which uses half cut through holes for easy to inspect soldering to its parent PCB. And I think this is the style we'll go for. For programming STM32s, the serial wire debug interface accessed through an ST link like this one is generally preferred over USB since you get more debugging options. And plus, even the smallest USB connector is too big for this PCB and might cause some issues since it's pretty hard to pull out. So I'll just use a four pin vertical JCSH for power and programming, which I would say makes this microcontroller independent and therefore comparable to the other microcontroller boards I'll be showing you guys later in the benchmarks. Now that we've established the form factor, microcontroller part, and general structure of the board, it's time to go through some data sheets, application notes, and a Phil's Lab video so that we can make the schematic and PCB design. Routing the PCB is a lot different for a wafer level package. At this scale, if you need to access the electrical connections which aren't on the perimeter of the footprint, you need to actually put a via inside of the pad, route it on another copper layer, and then ask your PCB manufacturer to fill the via with epoxy and plate over it with copper so that it can be soldered to. As you can imagine, this is all an extremely delicate process, but it was no problem for this channel's sponsor, PCBWay, whose advanced PCB service handled these tight tolerances brilliantly after I simply put in my ordering parameters, uploaded the three Gerber files, which included a time of flight sensor and the carrier PCB, and confirmed what my PCB requirements were with my sales rep. Now, while this project shows us some of the best of PCBWay's PCB capabilities, they also do CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication, and much more. So if you'd like to check out your one-stop shop for all your prototyping and manufacturing needs, make sure to click the first link in the description to sign up and make your designs reality. About two weeks later, the boards were here and all broken up into their individual pieces from the panels they were once in. And in my classic fashion, I decided it would be a good idea to try soldering the most intricate chip in this entire design myself, which is, you guessed it, the main microcontroller. I failed a few times, but with enough flux and careful positioning in the chip, I was able to get two working boards out of five by first connecting them to my benchtop power supply to test if they're drawing the right current and lit up properly, before connecting them to this dodgy ST link to JST SH adapter and oh verifying that the SWD connection and programming did in fact work. Look at it, it has a serial connection. Oh my. Now to prove that my teeny tiny board was better than an ESP32 S3, as I was saying, we needed a benchmark. And CoreMark is the obvious choice here since it appears in pretty much all microcontroller data sheets. But unfortunately, I couldn't get that up and running on Nano X. This was because I hadn't explicitly broken out a USART interface. So instead, I took some inspiration from this video and got this little formula to run up which calculates pi as a benchmark instead. 
Here are the results, and as you can see, the world's smallest STM32 explosively shats on all of the other microcontrollers, not only in terms of raw processing speed, but also in terms of the ratio of processing speed to board area of the smallest breakout available for that specific chip. That is, until you consider the Arduino Nikla Vision, a sweaty STM32H7 dual core board, which is only 3.8 times bigger, with 15 times the score, which just makes all the other boards look weak. To be honest though, I would take my own benchmark results with a grain of salt. They're so shallow and don't implement any optimizations as far as I know, so you're not really getting an apples to apples comparison here. I graphed the core mark scores too, and this time there's a clear winner in terms of density, even if the STM32H7 still beats it in terms of its actual score. The thing is, we weren't going for the absolute fastest, we were going for the smallest with enough GPIO to control those robots, and then the absolute fastest, so in my books, that's still a win. After benchmarking and all that stuff, I suddenly remembered that I accidentally pushed down on the wafer level chip really badly during initial soldering of one of the two working boards, causing an amount of movement that looked like a short would have been likely, so I attempted to fix it. And in the process, I caused the short myself, which made some magic smoke when I powered it. So now I only have one working copy. It just goes to show you how impractical, I mean delicate, this project is. But if I were to go back and have the opportunity to do it again, I probably would, just for the memes. Anyways, if you're wondering what I'm up to now, my bachelor starts in two weeks, which I'm mostly excited but a little scared for. The fact that I passed my first course though gives me a lot of hope. As I've mentioned before, the university is hours away from where we currently live, so we're also moving houses and we've been packing stuff up for the past few months to prepare for that. That also means that the costs of new equipment and services that we'll need for that home are slowing down my development, since we can't afford tools like a hot air station or electronic load to bring you guys better content. So if you'd like to help me learn just a little bit faster and see some cooler things from this channel, please consider donating through Super Thanks, memberships, or buying one of my boards from PCBWay Projects. But even if you don't, I really just appreciate all of you guys who are here watching this video. In the next videos after this series, you can expect to see some unique battery management projects which include next generation silicon anode batteries, brushless and brushed motor controllers, smart home projects, even faster microcontrollers, and a cat communication button with a twist. Thanks so much for sticking around and subscribe because I'm trying to hit 50k this year, so bye.